you know, this is a very interesting experience. I don't know how it is for you uh, sitting there listening, um, but, you know, to be kind of this disembodied speaker who is talking to you from Northern California in a little town called Petaluma, which is about an hour from San Francisco, and just imagining all of you, many of you that are <clears throat> on this call from the United States, from the Middle East, from Europe, uh, it's very exciting to me, and I really appreciate your um, coming to this. Uh, a couple of things just as a way of kind of starting. Uh, one of them is that <clears throat> I'm my intention here is to present something to you that I'm hoping will be both thought-provoking uh, and that also will lead you to consider looking into this more. Um, if, if nothing else, the most important thing would be that it would really uh, provoke your curiosity. And <clears throat> the second thing I wanted to say is that this is really based upon 45 years of kind of pressure testing ideas. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> that none of what I'm going to be presenting to you is new or untested. It's all material that I've tried out both as a senior leader uh, and also at times in a consulting or coaching capacity. Uh, so one thing that you can rely on is that at least within the circumstances that I've tried it, that these tools, these skills uh, really do work. So let me start, and I'd just like to pose a question to you. If your CFO, if your chief financial officer came to you and said, we just found in an audit a source of revenue that we did not know we had and it is very big, would you turn away? Would you ignore that? If a dear friend told you that they had found in their basement a treasure of untold wealth, would you tell them to hide it? or bury it? If you knew that with hard work you could be 20 times more effective, would you postpone that effort or decide not to work at it at all? Every company, team, and person has hidden treasure. It is found in three inner foundations that all lead to the same place, thriving on change. Today's webinar represents an advance in leadership, art, and science that integrates applied neuroscience, social psychology, and behavioral economics. Leaders must thrive in changing conditions, not just cope or survive. Here's how. So let's start with one of the most important kind of premises in <clears throat> this uh, thought that I'm presenting to you. And what is what are leaders accountable for? Well, one way that you could think of it is that within your own purview, that you're responsible for setting strategy and direction. You're responsible for building organizational capacity and capability and of course executing on results. So let me just break those down a little bit. So first of all, whether it's with your team or whether it's just for yourself, you're the one who's really responsible for knowing what the big picture is and what the direction is that you're going to take. Secondly, if you have people that report to you your job is to build organizational capacity. What I mean by that is that if I'm your boss, what I want to see from you is that you and your team, your division, your function are building capacity, meaning that you're able to uh, take on more and more. And lastly, I want you to be able to build skills. I'm, it's very important to me that you develop yourself and other people so that they're skilled, that they're competent, that they're capable of being able to deal with the stresses that every organization faces. And finally, you're responsible for executing on results. In the long run, the basis for any leader's legacy is what they produce. And what I mean by that 
is that you can talk about what you're going to do. You can tell me about what your intentions are. But in the long run, I'm going to look and see what is it that you actually did. And the reason why this is so important is that if I were in your position, and I have been, I'd be looking for tools and skills that are going to raise the quality of what I can produce while at the same time dealing with constant change. So the second bullet, constant change, is a profound factor in outcomes. So one of the key points of this webinar is that if a leader puts change in the center of their competency development, meaning that if the skills that you develop have to do with adapting, coping, and <clears throat> feel, facing change head on, that you immediately have a competitive advantage. Fundamental change versus short-sighted change influences results dramatically. Well, what I mean by that is that you have to learn how to deal with change as a fundamental rather than reacting and reacting and reacting. That's more the short-sighted change that I'm speaking to. Yeah, I, I know that any leader can respond or react to what is facing them at any given moment. That's short-sighted change. But do you know how to deal with change in a fundamental way? Leaders who thrive on change have a huge advantage over those who resist or ignore change. Leaders who thrive on change integrate the skills of working with turbulence, and they teach others to thrive on change. Let me give you an example. Recently, I had a team of seven people that were reporting to me, and many of them had a relationship to the changes that were going on in the organization of what I might call aversion. Aversion. What I mean by that is that they didn't like what was happening, and instead of trying to figure out to, how to make the best of it, they dug their heels in and were trying to find ways to slow it down or sabotage it. Now, the problem is that that's not dealing with reality. Reality is that things are going to change and that you have some influence but not complete control. Leaders who thrive on change know how to deal with what is happening around them or what's coming towards them that they don't have direct control over. I believe that what I'm presenting to you is a new model of leadership and in that model there are three big skill sets that if an individual, a team, or an organization adopts and develops that you're going to see engaged employees and increased results. So those three big skill sets, and I'm going to go into each of these in a moment, is our awareness, attention, and goodwill. The new leader's challenge is to dramatically increase employee engagement, which is the goodwill factor, while sustaining quality and innovative output. How we respond to change changes everything. Change and stress are like the air we breathe. If you introduce carbon monoxide, which is tasteless and odorless, into our breathing, we die slowly without apparent cause. Too much stress of a negative type or even too much positive stress without balancing causes breakdowns. It is possible to expand dramatically our capacity and our capability to deal with stress and change. Okay, key point. One of the most important discoveries about human beings is that the brain is highly highly trainable. The term is called neuroplasticity and it means basically that the brain is plastic and that we can do two things. One is we can stop doing things that don't work 
And secondly, we can develop new neurological grooves that increase our skill set. So why all the focus on change? Well, first of all, Harvard Business Review reports that leaders are overwhelmed by stress. One of the uh, articles that I read said that the most important factor with regard to uh, thriving is leaders learning how to deal with stress. Stress and change are interchangeable in practice. What I mean by that is that where there's change, there's stress. A term that Harvard Business Review introduced that actually is from the, the military, VUCA. VUCA causes disruptive organizational environments. And what is VUCA? What it refers to is change that is volatile, change that is filled with uncertainty, change that is complex, and change that is ambiguous. And when you take all four, VUCA is having an extraordinary effect on people's ability, on staff, on leaders' ability to get things done. The good news is that in the midst of massive change, we can be highly adaptive and creative if we understand the skills underlying change mastery. So here's a term that I've introduced. The term is change mastery. And what I mean by that is literally that you, as a leader, you as an individual, can develop the skills, the competence, to be able to respond to change in creative, innovative, innovative, adaptive ways. Today's organizations require masters of dancing on jello. Now, I'm not sure whether or not you're familiar with uh, what jello is. It's a uh, somewhat food substance or a semi-food substance. Um, and if you look at it, it's like this quivering mass of um, shaking jelly. And that's what is required of today's leaders, is that we have to be able to dance on this surface, this foundation that's constantly shaking and moving. But those who get good ride it superbly. How to have a thriving operating system, something I call a TOS. Well, what is the thriving operating system? We all have an operating system. We can learn to hack it. Some of you may be familiar with the book, Search Inside Yourself wonderful book that's written specifically for people who are what you might call highly analytic people. And the term operating system borrowed directly from the software and computer industry is a way of describing the worldview that we have. It's the way that we cope. It's the way that we adapt. That's our operating system. And learning to hack it means learning how to work with it, influence it, um, deal with it directly. And the first step in understanding how to thrive is to step back to go forward. And here's what I mean by stepping back. We can learn to observe with fair and neutral perspective our actions and our reactions. This stepping back is called mindful awareness. And some of you may be familiar with the term. You may have read some things about mindfulness. Um, it's been called one of the most important innovations in neuroscience, applied neuroscience. And we can do this at any time. Let me give you an example. So um, in the comfort of your chair, what I'd like you to do just for a moment is close your eyes. And I hope that you're comfortable just closing your eyes for a moment. And this is a way of um, concentrating, focusing a little bit more. And with your eyes closed, what I'd like you to do is to see if you can just observe your breath, breathing. Just watching your breathing. You're an objective observer. You're a participant observer. Just watching the breath as it enters 
leaves your body in and out, breathing. This is an example of stepping back. So what we're doing is we're taking a moment and pausing and just reflecting on an autonomic function called breathing. This is a step in mindful awareness. An important premise of this new leadership model is that evolving leaders have learning mindsets. So the contrast on your screen is fixed versus learning. So what are the elements of a fixed mindset? Well, it's a belief that we are whom we are. We just are who we are. That's it. People cannot change. You do with what you have. And one of the characteristics is that we don't believe that the brain can be trained. We don't really do things when we have a fixed mindset to change our perspective, our attitude, our, our point of view. People who have a learning mindset, on the other hand, believe that they can develop themselves. They are constant learners, meaning that when things occur in their life, good or bad, they are often asking the question, what can I learn from this? How could I do this better the next time? What's important here for me to understand? Our capacity for adaptation is vast. The brain can be trained. And the kind of training that we can do is both, are both things that you're familiar with, like developing critical thinking, developing the ability to understand cognitive biases that we have, and then maybe some things that you haven't really thought of yet, which are in the area of awareness training or attentional training. So here's a key point that if you're thinking about, well, how would I apply this? I mean, this is all very well and good and kind of interesting, but what do I do? Every meeting is an opportunity to improve how the organization adapts to change. If you want to think of where the highest leverage is in your, your day, it's every meeting that you attend or that you lead. Well, that's a bold claim. What I would say is that meetings are the best place to develop change mastery. And why? Well, well, meetings are where all results get produced or not. You know, you, you step into a meeting, you spend an hour, and you walk out of there, and you're evaluating it. I know you do. I do. We all do. We evaluate, and we evaluate on whether or not the results that we thought were going to be the intended outcomes get produced. Good meetings leave participants feeling like they accomplished something worthwhile. Just think about it for a moment. You don't need to say anything about this or even comment on it. But how often do you leave meetings going, that was a waste of my time? Well, what I'm offering to you is an opportunity to use meetings as a place to learn how to do two things. One is adapt to change, work with change, and secondly, to create engaged workplaces. The Gallup organization reports that only 13% of all staff are engaged. That means a lot of people are just biding their time. Well, let's use um, meetings as a place to talk about mindfulness or awareness. Mindfulness is synonymous with the term awareness. Meetings have conversations. They have discussions and arguments. How we act in the meeting depends upon how we self-observe. Are we reacting? In other words, words, are we just re reacting to what people are saying? Are we emotionally responding? Or are we acting in a way that's responsible for our words and intentions? 
we can bring self-awareness to meetings and be more influential. I mean, just first for a moment, think of a time when you were in a meeting and you reacted strongly to something that you heard and you either kind of left the meeting mentally or you got upset and you started feeling aggressive towards the person or towards the idea. Did you handle that, did you handle that skillfully? If you did not handle as well as you want to, self-awareness can bring much more influence. Here's some suggestions. Next meeting you are attending, prepare yourself by committing, and the term is objective awareness. Before the meeting, think through how you're, you may have re -emo reacted emotionally in the past. Look over the agenda or think about what the agenda is from your point of view and prepare yourself for topics that may be emotionally charged and asked. What is my desired outcome for this agenda item? The most powerful question that you can ask, and you can ask it over and over again, is what is my intention right now? When you find yourself losing track of your motive and your intention, it means you're reacting emotionally. So what do you do? You can learn to keep your emotions in check with something that I call hazmat containment, hazardous materials containment. Our emotions must be regulated or contained to be influential. Now, I don't mean that we ignore or that we deny um, our emotions because emotions are a very important part of why people are productive. But what we can do is we can contain our human natural responses of fight, flight, or freeze by two steps. Number one, be objectively honest when you're experiencing emotion. You know, if you're feeling something and you're in a meeting, the simplest and most direct thing you can do is just to say, oh, I'm feeling pretty angry right now, or I really feel like this person is just not telling the truth, or this is not right, and I have a strong reaction to it. That's number one. Number two, breathe deeply. Hold the emotions in your observer awareness. So what I mean by that is that by taking long, slow, deep breaths, we can actually place our emotions in a container, a hazmat container, and we can just let them sit there while we develop more of an objective observer awareness. Well, that's making me meetings meaningful for yourself. Well, how do you make meetings meaningful for others? Well, your job as a leader is to focus the attention of others on the conversations that are happening in this meeting. A meeting is the locus of focus, meaning that this is where focus exists or it doesn't. Meeting agendas with desired outcomes are critical, and the reason why, they sharply focus the participants. One of the first things that I encourage leaders who want to develop focus in meetings is to make sure that their agendas don't only have the topics that they're going to be talking about, but also what are the desired outcomes, what are the results that you want to see for each agenda item. Number three. Formalize dissent so that it is normalized to avoid group think. Look, if you're the kind of leader who wants people to just say yes and agree with you, then this doesn't really pertain to you. But if you want your meetings to be a place where people feel confident, comfortable, and safe to talk about their objections, their concerns, and so that you really get a variety of thinking about the agenda items, then it's important to formalize dissent. And one way that you can do that is to have people 
be encouraged to talk about their concerns that they may feel about agenda items. And then the last one is sustain attention in the meeting through robust processes. And what I mean by that is that there are meeting tools that anyone can learn and that immediately make a huge difference. An example of that I've already given you, which is having meeting agenda with desired outcomes. If nothing else you took away, if that was the only thing that you got out of today, that would be plenty. Leaders focus intentionally. Well, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N. Uh, Dan is a close friend and a collaborator, and much of what I've learned about emotional intelligence and his most recent work on focus comes directly from Dan's research. So if you're interested in a great book, Daniel Goldman's book, Focus, wonderful book for leaders. Focus and relaxation are two tools that lead to thriving. Thriving requires sharp attention and soft relaxation. Here's a thought experiment. Imagine what it would be like if you kept your arm extended out for the next few hours. You know, if let's just imagine for a moment you put your arm out, you <clears throat> flexed the muscles, you locked the elbow, and you did that for several hours. That's what we do when we don't relax regularly. We actually are sabotaging ourselves by not relaxing because we cannot be at our best if we don't balance sharp attention and soft relaxation. Here are some tools that I've developed that are for sharpening attention. 